Good evening, good evening, good evening, family. Welcome to another edition of Thorough Black Talk with your sister Keisha, your brother Tad, and your brother Ashe SJ. Uh, brother Tad will be joining us shortly. And this week, my brother Ashe SJ is off. He will return next week. We are live on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch, and something else. <laughs> But I'm glad to be joining you all this week. We got a lot to discuss. A lot is taking place. And I'm looking forward to getting all of your comments, your input, your questions. We definitely going to address your questions, your concerns, and your comments. So don't you worry about that. Abibi Fahodier, Sister Fonessa, nice to have you black with us again. We about to go in. Um, this past Sunday... Uh, you had, what is it, your BET Awards. We got to deal with that. We got to break all of that down. We going deep. We going deep because, you know, my grandmother used to have this saying, uh, fish thinks from the head. So we going to go to the head and connect all the dots for you all tonight. We also going to discuss um, uh, a myriad of concerns um, attitudes, pushback from the release of Dr. William H. Cosby. We're going to deal with that. We also um, going to look at um, benign neglect. You know, what does that all mean as it relates to the black political um, structure? Um, and how is it that uh, these political parties are neglecting our needs and concerns right in front of our face. So we got a lot to discuss. We're going to break all of that down. We got some new information and news that we got to share with you all tonight. So buckle up because it's about to get ready. Raw. What's up, brother? Second raw. Uh, what's up to you and the queen? I see y'all out there exercising, doing your thing. I love that. I love that because we got to stay healthy, at least as healthy as we possibly can. Um, as we move through this maze uh, called the United States. So keep doing what you're doing. Sister Aminatu, what's up with you, Black Power? Tell you, Queen, keep doing what you're doing. I love it. I love it how everybody shares information. Again, family, like the page, uh, share the page. You can DM it to somebody or messenger to somebody or have a way you do your social media. Um, the only thing we want you to do is share it and like and subscribe while you sister Joyce in the building. How you doing? What's up with Monty? How, how y'all feel? You know, I hope everything is all right on y'all front. My big brother and my big sister always got to shout them out 100%. So kudos to you all. And I always give you all your flowers while you're still here because one never knows. You know, when it's time to exit up out of here, you know, ask Donald Rumsfeld. You know, it's funny. He uh, died yesterday and Mr. Cosby was, was released yesterday. Um, crazy. Now, this weekend, we got a new release of a film because we definitely going to continue our subject matter from last week on um, black music. You know, now we're in July 1st, supposedly. Black Music Month is over, but you have a new film release. I believe it'll be on Hulu and in the theaters, Summer of Soul. So I'm definitely going to check that out this weekend. I got to get down to downtown Brooklyn, the International Arts uh, Festival taking place in Commodore Park, you know, City Park, 
those of us who grew up in that area, they can change the name all they want to, but that's what we call it. That's what we're going to keep on calling. So we do what we want to do. But I definitely got a lot of running around. I got some friends coming into the city uh, this weekend. So, you know, catch me where you can because I'm going to be moving around the place. But, you know, things on my end, I'm doing very well. I got a little sunburn. I was out there just about every day. <laughs> during this heat wave, you know, temperatures of 100 degrees and better. But to me, I love it. You know, I just stay hydrated and, um, you know, keep pushing, keep pushing. And I always remember, excuse me, everything that our ancestors went through, they had no breaks, you know, sun beaming down on them in the dead of winter, wherever. They still had to keep pushing through to maintain themselves so that we can all be here. So we're going to definitely get into all of that. But to continue uh, where we left off last week, um, one of the things that I didn't discuss um, is the meaning of the word Amazon. Anybody know what the meaning of the word Amazon means? Um, put it in the chat. And uh, we'll see, see, see if you got it all together here, because um, things are coded in languages that we do not understand. So we're going to have to decipher and break all of that down. Shout out to Dr. Filet. Keep doing what you're doing. Check her out every Saturday on Blog Talk Radio Network, 1030 p.m. Shout out to the Professor William Mackey Brooklyn Study Group. They out there doing their thing. Kudos to Brother Ray Ray. Sister Veronica always on the front. You never know where you're going to catch Sister Veronica at. She'd be all over the place. Yes, Brother Second Rider, ancestors had no days off. None. And um, I think now um, they are trying to connect with us, those of us who claim to be woke <laughs> and aware. Um, our ancestors are definitely trying to connect with us in ways that um, some of us understand and some of us do not. You know, just the other night, uh, day before yesterday, as a matter of fact, I had a dream about uh, my mother who transitioned many, many years ago. And um, But in this dream, uh, she wasn't saying much, but she was constantly smiling at me and um, pointing to things that I should be aware of. Well, one of her favorite uh, songs was uh, by Angie Stone, uh, No More Rain. And um, so when I woke up the following morning, not to get into the particulars of the dream, but when I woke up the following morning, a friend of mine, shout out to Kendla Anderson, has sent that video to me at approximately 1.59 a.m. So, you know, you never know how the ancestors are trying to reach you. So I think uh, my mother is happy about me pushing this music history that we all should know about. And um, I hope, Brother Second Ra, I hope you were able to check out that film this weekend. We're going to play the trailer a little bit later for you all, Summer of Soul, which is um, a collaborated, documented work that was remastered um, by our brothers of the roots. Um, why is his name escaping me? I don't know. But um, he has remastered it and you know put it into film so that we can all see that. Because in 1969, um, when you had the Woodstock uh, concerts, you also had the cultural uh, festival in Harlem that had taken place. Um, you had a serious lineup, you know, from what I understand, that was a year before I was born, put my age out there, but you had artists like Nina Simone, your BB King, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, Chuck Jackson, uh, Stevie Wonder, the great Mahalia Jackson, uh, Mom Mavely even was out there, the Fifth Dimension, Gladys Knight and the Pips. So... It's very important that we connect with our true music history because right now um, other groups and other entities are co-opting our music 
and uh, <clears throat> our cultural heritage. So I think, um, especially for those of you who are artists or in the field of music, that you understand the history and where it all comes from. So um, I'm excited to see that film. I might go tomorrow night. If not tomorrow night, then Saturday early uh, with the hubby. We'll make a date out of it because I know he's going to want to go eat after that. So we got we got to do all of that. You got to get in them date nights for real. Um, and, and that's a topic that uh, we can discuss at a later date. Um, it's important that if you are in relationship or are courting, that you understand that the same energy that you put into one another when you are in the court courtship, that you continue that um, because you don't want your relationship to become boring. Of course, you know, thing, you all grow, you progress the same likes and needs and wants that I had uh, 20 some odd years ago. I no longer have those needs and wants. And so we evolve. So your relationship has to evolve. So we, he and I are in different spaces right now, but we are growing together and that's important. So I see we got my brother Tad in the building. How you feeling brother Tad? Better days ahead. Yes, yes, yes. I'm feeling real good, sis. Like life is good. You see I'm in a new space right now. So not just physically, but also mentally. So life is good, you know? I, I came in on tail and I guess he's talking um, Black Music Month, which um, surprisingly, on my way here, I got dropped off. So um, one of my homies was playing the new music by the Young Boys, Sister Keisha. You know I don't listen to that. <laughs> but today I listened to it. And the things these young people are talking about, I said, yo, it's amazing the level of wisdom that these young artists have. I guess I'm at that age now where as soon as I hear them young voices, I don't want to hear it. But my man was like, just listen, listen to what he's saying. And I guess they call it pain rap. I mean, he's like, yo, it's a genre called pain rap. I'm out the loop, sis. I'm old. I'm a grandpa now, you know, but it was crazy because I'm listening to the pain of these young artists. And he was like, remember how we grew up. And it's crazy that these young artists are still going through this level of pain because this is why our music is soul music, because we talk about how our soul feel, how our spirit feel. We talk about the joys of love and the, and the agony of pain, you know? So today I listened to it like, I was impressed. I was impressed as, you know, being a fan of hip hop, because in our generation, the lyrics had to say something. Now these young boys are saying something. And it's just amazing the level of pain that exists out here. But with that pain, they also have an elevate, elevated level of wisdom about them too. What they're saying, how they're saying it, because they're still artists. You just gotta find creative ways to say how you feel, to talk about your pain. And these boys, so yeah, yeah, that's how I feel. It was just crazy. Cause you know, um, as we just wrapped up Black Music Month, you know, that's still Black music. And tonight was the first time I really just listened. Normally, it gets no play, but I wasn't in my car, so I had to listen to what was on, you know. But other than that, I'm good, sis. You know, I'm good. I'm good. That's what's up. Uh, Brother Second Ross said he needs you to hit him. He got something made for you. Oh, no so um, I guess after we log off, you can hear Yes. All right. Did I lose you, sis? Hit him up. You see. Ah. All right. Can everybody hear me? Because the Wi Fi and internet service has been going in and out. You know, we had yeah, storm yeah. and everything. So, and it's still raining. Well, at least here where I'm located. So, yeah, like yeah. I told you, you know, my, my internet can go in and out at any time because our lines are outside. They're not underground. But um, I was saying, you know, I have nieces and nephews and my children are young in their mid 20s, early 30s. And um, I got to get my dose of trap music and all that, too. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty much aware on, of some of these artists that are out here doing some things. So 
you are definitely right. We cannot disconnect ourselves. It's just that, you know, music evolves and yeah, it changes. Yeah. So you either fall by the wayside or you move ahead with it. Um, some of it can be distasteful as it was in our generation. We had music that was just as equally uh, distasteful, yeah, you know? Yeah. So it is what it is. But, you know, I was saying um, this weekend, uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, the Summer Soul documentary is going to be released um, on Hulu and I believe in the theaters tomorrow. So you check your local listings if you don't have Hulu or what have you and try to get out and see it because this was the same year that Woodstock uh, was t took place and everybody talks about Woodstock, but no one talks about the Harlem Cultural Festival. So um, we cannot let our history just be whitewashed in that way, especially in light of what we saw past this past Sunday uh, with the BET Awards. I don't know if you saw any of it, Brother Tad, but I actually was challenged to watch it. Um, it was a $50 bet. <laughs> I'm trying to recoup my brain cells. <laughs> oh, man. Did you win? Did you win 50 bucks? Of course. <laughs> I'm not playing. You put that bread on the table. I'm not playing. Don't challenge me, you, you know. Uh, but I watched it from beginning to end. Um, well, I did want to see her because I'm a, I'm a fan of her music and her work. So I did want to see her and I did want to see um, the tribute to DMX, which they saved to the end of the program, the last six minutes of the program. Um, and even there was some symbolism in how it was presented, not with the artist, but how it was presented. Um, Brother Second Ross said they, they try to call it Black Woodstock. And the Harlem Cultural Festival started first. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why we have to know our history. You're absolutely right. The sister Amanetta said, I couldn't watch it. I heard it was a total S show. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, I'll just say that as I began, Brother Tad, you know, my grandmother used to always say that fish thinks from the head. And um, when you understand the head of BET or Viacom CBS, and I think I sent that article to you and Brother Ashe, yes. um, you can see the diabolical nature of the owners of that network and why you saw what you saw on Sunday. Because year after year, it's been getting worse and worse and worse. And they had the nerve um, brother Tad to call it the year of the black woman. Um, but there was nothing but nudity, um, gyration, um, vile, um, disrespect for black womanhood. Um, not talking directly about the artist's music. Um, because as Sister Sam Tam said earlier, sometimes you got to listen to that again going, she like Meg Thee Stallion. But <laughs> it was just so perverse. Um, it was a message of pushing nudity. T to me, Brother Tad, it looked like soft porn to me. You know, right. that's my take on it. Nothing but soft porn. That's just my take on it. Um, uh, you had a disrespect for uh, Monique by the cast of a BET sit sitcom. I don't know the name of that sitcom, but it was three actresses or four actresses uh, from a new sitcom on BET. And they tried to make a mockery of Monique's um, word of advice to our sisters about leaving the house, not looking your best, um, and putting a bad image out of, of who you are. Not to say that you are, 
you know, she wasn't saying that at all. She just was explaining representation is everything when you're before the world, not when you, you know, amongst your family or whatever. But um, so there was shots thrown at her. There was open um, homosexual uh, I saw that. Act that took place, um, blatant while um, making a mockery of ancient Egyptian comedic culture. Um, and, and, and when I saw that, when he first came out, um, first of all, I had to watch it downstairs because my husband was ready to throw the TV and me out the window. But <laughs> so I had to go to downstairs. But when I saw um, his performance with the um, Egyptian dress and the dances, it was reminiscent of Michael Jackson's Remember the Time. But here he flips it. Um, he totally makes a mockery, not just of our culture, but the genius of Michael Jackson at that time. Um, I don't know if a lot of people caught that, but that's what took place. And um, my thing is this, if I'm in a space that's uncomfortable, um, I'm not gonna sit there. I'm not gonna sit there and the camera panned around to a lot of the men who were sitting there and you can see that a lot of the men were perturbed by what they saw um but they didn't walk out and i thought i think that could have been a critical move if they had done so yeah to let viacom and bet know we ain't rocking with this this ain't who we are and um like i said it started with the soft porn and everybody was twerking. Nobody had no clothes on. Then it went to this performance by Lil Nas X and um, him engaging and grinding on and kissing on another man. And to close the show out, they give a six, six or less minute um, performance in honor of DMX. So to me, the way I saw it was you know, um, she, uh, okay. I just got a message from brother. Ashe. he might be making it in tonight, but to me, it looked as if, um, they were saying, this is what it is now. And straight black masculinity is on the way out. This is the message that I got. Um, and I found it disturbing because, um, like I said, a lot of the men who was who were there um, looked to be disturbed by it, but they kept sitting there. You know, what are your thoughts on, on that, brother Tag? And then we'll go to the chat, get some comments in here. We can't hear you, brother Ted. Um, let me see. You might gotta adjust your volume. We can't hear you, brother Ted. Um, let me see. We gonna try to get these kinks worked out. Like I said, it's been storming here in the city, and Wi-Fi is going in and out. So please oh, excuse now. us. Perfect, perfect, my okay. brother. <laughs> so what I was saying. Is had they been forewarned, that would have been a perfect opportunity to organize a walkout. Because I'm quite sure that wouldn't have been hard to do. Be like, yo, son, you know I ain't with all this, that, that. Yo, when they do that, son, I'm getting up walking out. You with me? Something as simple as that, you know? But they always like to spring these things on us. And we know what's coming. We just never know when. And all it takes is for us to just say, yo, and just a minute. Yo, as soon as they start that, I'm walking out because we know it's intentional. I think I sent you a clip of a lesbian that was talking about the agenda. Yeah, we're gonna play that clip too. I, I gotta pull it up. As you but, speak, but, I'll pull it up. But what's so crazy, sis, is that we've been saying that for years from our own personal conversations with people from that community. They don't fully co-sign the agenda. And that's the point we've always been trying to make. It's not against the people personally, it's the agenda to push it, promote it, and direct everybody's attention from the issues that really matter and put it somewhere else. 
because um when Sister Keisha plays the um clip for those who didn't see it, the sister lay it down perfectly. Because what she go through doesn't have anything to do with her sexuality. It has to do with her blackness. And she talks about that. And y'all know for years we've been talking about that. It's not necessarily we're against a specific person. It's the whole agenda, them pushing that on our children, them shoving it down our throats. That's what we are against. And it's funny that people from that community is now speaking up and no longer being scared because they called them bullies. They said that group all together are just bullies, you know, but I digress. Sis. They do. And um, what's happening is now, you know, I, I remember when, like I said before, many times when Don Imus made those disparaging and disrespectful remarks about the sisters on the Rutgers basketball team, I warned our people. Don't silence him. Don't push to silence him because it's going to backfire on you. You are not going to take down one of the biggest uh, names in mainstream media at that time and think it's not going to backfire on you. Um, but, you know, our people get caught in their feelings and, you know, people didn't heed the warning and now we're facing it. A shout out to Dr. Filet. Always, always, sis, I will be in your town the end of this month. So I'll get in contact with you. Um, I'm going to meet up with Brother Oma Wally and some other people. I got to see some family out there. So I'm going to be moving and shaking while I'm in Philly. <laughs> but I'm going to play this clip that Brother Tad sent to me uh, earlier this week. Here is a woman who uh, says she is a former lesbian or what have you or worked as uh, to help. Um, I'm not going to talk. We're just going to have to talk. Hold on a second. Organize uh, social events for lesbians of color at the time. Myself and I had two other business partners and we were a perfect fit. We would rent restaurants and invite women to come and uh, sort of uh, amass a, a mail list. And women would come from all over the region. And on a, any holiday night, uh, the group was called Hospitality Atlanta. It would not be um, odd to have seven to eight hundred women exclusively packed into a beautiful restaurant with we hired police at the door and would not let a man in. And from those events, we we had softball leagues and softball teams and then and, and uh, major, you know, picnics and whatnot. It was just a, a, a great at that time. We thought organization. We made a lot of money. And uh, we did that for nearly 10 years. And when we got older and decided that we didn't want to do it anymore, you know, I decided, well, what are we going to do with this mail list? And from that mail list, uh, I decided to launch uh, a magazine. The gay and lesbian political community began to pay attention to the fact that we could bring um, numbers of black lesbians and gays together uh, through the work that we were doing. And then when the magazine was launched, surely uh, we began to get uh, contacted by HRC, Human Rights Campaign, and the Victory Fund, and uh, many of the gay organizations who, who, who are uh, doing a lot of work right now. And we were, it was a very important part um, in the early 90s of the work that they were doing because uh, at that time, they were being told by local uh, politicians or regional politicians and national politicians that, okay, you guys are rich, you are guys are a group of rich, white, gay men. And you wanted to change laws just for you. No, we don't see a coalition of people here. So it was important then to be able to raise up or show a Charlene Cawthorn or a, Vic or a Venus magazine to say, oh, no, there's a huge, vibrant black gay community. Look at that through the pages of Venus magazine. So we were an important part of what they were trying to present. The strategy is always to get one little foot in the door. When in fact, uh, the plan means we're going to take over the whole thing. Well, why don't we just get uh, a, a statement, uh, Mr. School Board President, in your school board policy that you simply acknowledge the fact that we, we will not we'll, we will not fire a gay teacher or that there may be some gay students that we're going to be uh, okay with, you know, um, not trying not to be prejudiced toward them through our policy. We just want one little statement in the booklet when in fact the plan is to take over the whole school system as we see now 15 years later is happening. There's always just, you know, that's the strategy just to get in under the wire and then once you get enough of our people in then to do some major work. 
I was asked to help with domestic partnership, the, the, uh, get the domestic partnership bill passed in Atlanta, Georgia. And they helped to train me to go in and speak with council people and to speak with uh, the mayor. And of course, they chose not only uh, people of color, but also people who were landowners. Of course, I owned a home at that time. And, and people who had a good, strong voting record. That was also... Um, very important. And so um, we would go in under the wire and basically what, what we were trained is that don't talk to anybody else about this. All we want to do is get in talk to the council people. We don't even want the church folk to, 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 to understand that this vote is coming up soon. We want to be able to fill the auditorium on vote day with all gay and lesbian landowners so that the politicians will say, my God, we kind of have to do this. That's the strategy. That's the strategy. They were able to uh, infiltrate media. Uh, and even people, you know, I look at people who started out even with my small publication, people who started out with Venus magazine and were able to take, um, you know, tear sheets from our book um, are now working for some major newspapers, working for Bloomberg, working for the New York Times, working for Condé Nast. And so it, it's so true. It's like they, you know, the gays and lesbians run major media in this country. They just do. And I'm, I'm not sure how many, if the church really, well, maybe the evangelical church realizes that. But gays and lesbians really are um, at the forefront of me, major media decisions. And so then sitcoms. Um, Every sitcom, they, they, you know, I've heard that every sitcom is going to have a gay character, and it's coming true. It really is. And, of course, now gay characters have major talk shows. It, they really have taken over media. Why? Because media speaks directly into the minds of young people. So, you know, Did even she explains very clearly um how they maneuver and like we said this is not you you got gay people who talking about it's an agenda you got gay people speaking about speaking out against how they are pushing this on our children but even their voices are squashed um and now because of our political ignorance of brother tad we have voted for these things to be pushed forward you know uh, blindly so, unfortunately, we have uh, pushed this thing forward. You know, your comments, Brother Tad, on, on, on that piece. Well, I think it's timely, but unfortunately, like I say, I always quote Professor Anthony Browder, we always learn the rules to the game after everybody done went home. We've been, we've been um, singing this song for years now, you know, that this is not real, it's all manufactured. We've been telling them people from the LGBT community we don't co-sign the agenda. And people are like, oh, it's love, it's love, it's love. No, it's all political. It's political. And anytime it's political, it's an agenda with a goal in mind. And that's to inconvenience our life. All of us, all the citizens. It's, it's just crazy what it is they'll pick a quote unquote marginalized group and then bolster whatever they have going on and say, oh, we gotta fight for these people. Their rights are very important. Right. Meanwhile, we're constantly getting ignored. And then people, when around election time, people will come in and say, oh, I'm gonna do this for African-Americans, I'm gonna do that for the urban community, I'm gonna do this for black and brown people. And then we always end up with the short end of the stick. We take all the brunt of the force and the blows. We are always the ones out there on the front line. As soon as it's time to divide the spoils, we always get the leftovers, always. And we don't get it. I had a coworker try to talk politics with me and I, and I don't like arguing with certain people. So I don't cast my curls to swine. But she kept calling Joe Biden Papa Joe. Cause Papa Joe, Papa, I'm like, <laughs> Papa Joe, her oh, white daddy. <laughs> that's 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 crazy. That, that's crazy. And you know, I'm glad you brought that up because you had folks who were out there and still are out there trying to speak against 
what's happening. And please, y'all, don't misunderstand that, you know, our dissent or objectivity of what's happening is that we are telling you not to engage um, because you should just on the levels where we can win wars. Um, but there was some commentary. Um, this sister may hold on. Let me mute it real quick. Uh, yes, sorry about yes. that. Um, I'm going to bring that up because she made it plain. You know, the Democratic Party um, is really, really pushing this forward. And they have been for quite some time. And I'm also going to show a clip later. Um, I think Brother Tad did send me that one too. Um um, a great explanation of what benign neglect is and how it relates to us as black voters. But I'm going to show this clip real quick of this sister who was going in, you know, explaining her position, her point of view, and she wasn't with the shenanigans. So we hold on, family. We're going to play this real quick as she explains to this um, European liberal what our culture is and what our position is. And I see all of you on Twitch. I don't know why you can't make comments, but I'll try to work that out in the background. Hold on, family. <laughs> And this is this is why you see now uh, these political parties are pandering to other ethnic groups and other entities because the black voter is being awakened. Um, each season, um, the black vote decreases less and less. Um, if you if you doubt what I'm saying, you can always go to um, ballot.org. Ballot.org will have your state, your city, your district, and it'll give you the number of votes by demographic um, so you can see that for yourselves. But we live in a society now that hinders you from speaking out against it. Just having it, I don't have to agree. Why do I have to agree? And if I don't agree, why should I be penalized? Because I don't agree. So to me, you know, for all my um, Christian folks out there, um, it's like a resurgence of Sodom and Gomorrah. And like the sister said, too, when it comes to crime, there's shootings every night. Crime has been up 
Every time the Democrats are in power, crime is at an all-time high. Employment and underemployment thrives, and crime is at an all-time high. You can't deny that fact. So, you know, that's just my two cents in it. And, you know, brother, tag your two cents, and then we go to these comments, and I'm going to bring in um, about this Sumner family, because I want to tie all of this together with what we've witnessed on the BET Awards. Okay, I just want to say you and the sister hit it on the head. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hard to add on to that, but it is coming to the point where we are not allowed to have our own opinion. If you have an opinion outside of popular opinion, you can almost ostracize. It's almost like they want to stone you. How dare you think for yourself? If we want to know what you, if we want to know what you think, we'll tell you what to think. That's where we at with it right now. And people don't recognize mass media as being a propaganda machine. Coupled with the cell phones, because now I hear people say, oh, I don't watch TV anymore, but they're always in their phone. So they're always on social media, constantly getting the same message on how they're shaping society and programming us what to think and how to think and who to like and who not to like. And this is almost crazy right now. Because it's even to the point where if you don't say you got a shot, people got a problem with you. Oh, you got the shot? No, you didn't get the shot. It's like, yo. And people don't even know what it's like watching clones and robots. It's like no one has an original thought anymore. Like, well, what do you think? What do you think? No, don't tell me what you heard in the news or what you heard in the media. How do you feel? Take all your past life experiences for however long you've been on this planet, whether 18 years or 81 years, put all those experiences together and draw a conclusion on what's going on in the world right now. Because I am from the 90s where we were reading all these conspiracy theory books and we were learning about the Illuminati and the New World Order and the cashless society, and we are here. It's so funny now because even mainstream media is now talking about the existence of UFOs. When some of us have been talking about it for a long time and people are like, oh, you're crazy, you're bugging. And just basic mathematics, for the universe to be so vast, for it to be so many different forms of life on this one planet alone, how do we dare not think that the possibility just the possibility, I'm not saying there is, I'm not saying there isn't, but how could you not entertain the possibility of other life existing outside of our realm of awareness? How could you exclude that possibility when everything that exists on the planet didn't exist at one point, whether it's a car, whether it's a lamp, whether it's a laptop, it had to come from an idea, a thought that somebody had. And when you study ancient comedic philosophy, it talks about how the world began. It came from the primordial waters of the known. Same thing with, with Christian theology. The planet existed out of nowhere. We know these things. We know that we can control the level of our reality with our own independent thoughts. With our own independent thoughts, we shape our reality. How do we not see? Now, drawn from our own personal experience, how do we not see the powers that be manipulating information and events within our lifetime? What we know to be true. Why did it Bill Cosby out all of a sudden? Why? What's behind that? But we've been saying Bill was innocent for a minute. Not saying he was an angel, but we like, I knew, I was like, I, he was only convicted on the testimony of one woman that he'd been admitted that he'd been with. But look at how everybody was against Bill Cosby. Now, I listened to Gary, Gary M. Hotep Bird's show one night, and he was talking about Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben, saying how a lot of people didn't know Bill Cosby was sending them money to continue their research. Bill Cosby was funding and financing their projects. You're not going to do that if you don't care about Black people intellectually. I'm not saying you got to go out and feed the homeless. But we don't realize there's a psychosis within us and there's a particular group of black people within our community that just want to see us get our minds right. 
Some groups want to see us get our pockets right. You know, some people want to see us get our morals right. Bill Cosby was an intellectual, so he wanted to see us get our minds right. Start thinking a little more critically. Start understanding what we're caught up in and what we're fighting against. Because it's all about controlling people's mind. That's how slavery worked. That's why they use intimidation factors. They had to break you mentally and then spiritually. And then they control you. And for the ones they couldn't, they knew they would always have a problem. Abraham Lincoln wrote that in the letter to the British Crown after, after the Civil War. He said, I need a place to send these Negroes that want to go back to Africa. But we don't do enough reading and research and study of, of, old, polit of old politics and things like that, you know? So we run around regurgitating things we've heard from a favorite lecturer as opposed to doing our own independent study. Our lecturers and teachers are supposed to introduce us to the information. It's on us to peel back the layers and dig further and come up with our own synopsis, come up with our own hypothesis, our own conclusions. But I digress. Peace. See, we got our brother in the house. That's what's up. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but but you're right. You're right. And um, I, I see that often. <laughs> I see that often. Um, people just regurgitating, even mimicking um the gestures of some of our um great scholars. And it, it, it drives me insane. It drives me insane. Education is everlasting. You should always start at one point and let that be your beginning, but yeah. not your end. Because history is continuum. It continues. Um, and when make, you And we make history every day with the decisions we make. Yes. As a group. Because you and I were around in the 90s and the early 2000s. And decisions we make as a community effect on affects our direction as a community. And it's so unfortunate that so many don't get it. I mean, we got a sophisticated audience. Our audience is intelligent, you know, and I mean, this is our place to share the knowledge and information. But when we talk about the people, who are we talking about? We talk about our loved ones. We talk about our siblings, we talk about our aunts, our uncles, Sometimes our parents and grandparents don't really understand what's at hand right now, you know? And I think that's the most painful part of it all because how do you save the people you love? Because as to your point earlier about the regurgitation, just because a lot of people speak our language don't mean they really are folks like that because some of the folks are just trying to fit in and they're not being their authentic self. So when we start talking about critical thinking, think for yourself. That's what we mean. Think outside of mainstream media. Think outside of your little circle and go into the recesses of your own mind. And again, draw from your experience, your conclusion. Because so many people, sis, are afraid to be themselves now. They're hiding. They're hiding. Whether it's behind the suit, whether it's behind the dashiki, they're hiding. They're hiding. And it's like, well, what do you think? I was, I remember I was talking to a sister one time, right? And she's like, yeah, because homosexuality started in Africa. There ain't nothing wrong with it. It's, 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 it's an African tradition too. I said, where you get that from? She was stuck. She said, Dr. Umar. <laughs> I said, now you're lying. Now you're lying. My point is, she thought that she would just do a name drop that I'm unwell, unread, or wouldn't even research, that she could just throw a name out there and I'd be like, oh, okay. Nah, that's not how my brain operated functions. You know, I think for myself, Dr. Clark's thoughts was Dr. Clark thoughts. These be upon them. Malcolm's thoughts were Malcolm's thoughts. My thoughts are my thoughts. Why? Because my experience is different. Where I was born and raised, things I've been through, is different and i'm quite sure we all have our own story 
that we're still writing within our life. We're still writing our story out. So I refuse to let other people be the authors of my story. Tell me what to think. Tell me who to hate. Tell me how to feel. Only thing I do is pull out my moral compass and try to stay as straight as possible. Sometimes my needle go to the left. Sometimes my needle go to the right. But I try to keep my moral compass as straight as possible. You know, but I'm, I'm not perfect, you know. But I'm going to step off my soapbox. None of us are. None of us are. You write an exact. And um, like you said, you take that information and you draw your own blueprint. Because we have to navigate in this world. I Like, you know, how I move different from people in the South. I wasn't born in the South. I wasn't raised in the South. And frankly, I don't like it. So that's just me. That's just me. I move how I move. And um, it has kept me grounded. Grounded. It has kept me focused. Um, and it kept keeps me moving forward. You know, there is a proverb that says, excuse me, um, your character is everything. Your reputation is what people think of you. Mm. And right now, the character of us as a group, as black people, as a group, does not look good before the world. So we really got to clean ourselves up. You know, you clean your thought process up just a little bit to move forward. But um, definitely right, um, Brother Second Rod, turn your own pages. Turn your own pages because we got to navigate through this world. And another thing that I don't like, Brother Tad, and everybody don't have to agree with me, but mechanisms used, including that of your own thought, that were done in ancient times, ain't working today. Ain't working today. Like I always use this simple uh, act. Back then, they used the ink and a feather to write with. Try that now. <clears throat> First of all, you look crazy. And second of all, there are mechanisms, fountain pen and everything, pencils and everything, that you no longer have to do that. A lot of times, Brother Ted, I believe when our people study our history, um, our culture, Illusion. Culture in particular. Uh, all right, I think I'm back. I'm back. Uh, let me give a sound check. Okay, I'm back. All right, we back. Tell you, boy, this this Wi-Fi ain't playing. But um, we become stuck. You know, I see people dressing up in all kind of crazy costumes and stuff like that. I'm not wearing no stuff like that because that ain't my time. And I'm not trying to get caught in that time. You know, back then you wore one string sandal. Try that today. You look crazy. You know what I'm saying? So we really got to understand what study is and how to apply that. In particular, our music history. A lot of us don't really know our history. Um, I got some inboxes last week. People didn't know that Ray Charles was the first major soul, soul artist that broke the mold for everybody to be seen in that light as far as soul music is concerned. Um, a lot of people didn't understand of how Chess Records was a thorn in the side to Motown. You know, and I say all that to say, Everybody who look like us ain't for us because the commentary that Puffy made got on my nerves as it related to uh, Lil Nas X's performance. I didn't hear what he said. He said he did that. <laughs> so, he, I'm, 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 because I'm gonna get myself in trouble. We're going to get banned again. We already got a couple of strikes on our YouTube page as and it is. We've been going soft. We ain't been yes. going I think we've been mild. <laughs> they really are trying to shut down um, dissenting voices or objective voices. 
But that Sister Amanetu says, I believe that they saw the way black people believed in Obama to push this agenda along. Trump was there to expose those who oppose this agenda and the people who support it, which are mostly older black women, white feminists and gays. They succeeded now that the hatred for the unnatural has been exposed. They use that to get Biden voted in. True enough. That's Excuse me. That's why all of these dim laws are being passed for everyone except for straight blacks. And that's true. That's true. But I want to put a little twist on that, uh, Sister Aminatu, because you have a lot of organizations, groups, um, media, and out of media who do have dissenting voices. However, um, neither of them have a political apparatus to deal with this issue. You have to deal with this politically and you have to deal with this legally. How do you think they got it done? Not just rhetoric. Rhetoric is just that. Rhetoric. I don't care how many people you got in your group and y'all out there chanting your side, you're anti this and you're anti that. But if you have no political voice and you have no legal on to that political voice, your effort is of naught. Sorry, but that's just what it is. That's just what, it, listen, we showed you here on, the, on this pro program how the Asians were able to get the Asian hate crime bill passed in less than six months. We showed you what must be done, what must be done. And we don't want to look at that yet, but we have to. But um, yes, it, uh, definitely. <laughs> no, I don't know TV, B1 all day. Definitely that. Um, yes, we know we froze. Yeah, like I said, we got problems out here. Um, yes. Um, good evening, Sister Marie. Um, I think you're going on a trip soon, ain't you? <laughs> um, yes, Sister Keisha, absolutely. As Zora Neale Hurston said, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And that is true. You know, people even talk about, well, let me leave that alone. Let me pull up this article um, that was um, written by Business Insider. Um, it's a publication that I read. You all don't have to, but that's just something that I read. But um, in August of 2020, they released this article. And I have to say where I got it from, so you two don't. Um, hold on, everybody in Twitch. I see you. I'm working on that. Um, but anyway, going to this article, it says, an estranged son, a legal battle with a living lover and a mogul who wanted to live forever. Meet the heirs to the Viacom CBS empire. Um, let me see if I can make this full screen. Get me and brother Tad up out of there <laughs> and make this full screen so y'all can see. All right. Now, here is the family dynasty that is behind Viacom CBS, which are the owners of BET. Now, as I read this article, I want you all to remember the degeneracy, if you will, that took place during the BET award ceremony. Because again, fish things from the head. Um, Redstone. Um, I believe he's deceased now. This is the man you see in the chair right here. Um, these are his children, his late, well, latest wife. And we're going to get into the family dynamics. It says the media magnate Sumner Redstone, who forged an empire of entertainment companies encompassing CBS, Viacom, and Paramount Pictures, died Tuesday at the age of 97. His legacy business, <clears throat> excuse me, Viacom CBS is worth 16 billion. His personal net worth was estimated by Forbes to be 3 billion. He is survived by two children, Brett and Sherry Redstone. His daughter Sherry is the steward of much of his media empire. She owns a 20% stake in National Amusements. National Amusements. Um the family holding company, and is one of seven trustees overseeing Sumner's 80% stake. 
For much of the past decade, legal battles brewed over Redstone's trust as he grew older without letting go any of his stake. His mental capacity was often a subject of the litigation. His five grandchildren are now the beneficiaries of his trust. But at one point, his will included two women he lived with after his second divorce. Here's a look at the Redstone family dynasty. Let's go down here. Okay. Redstone was born in Boston in 1923. He enrolled at Harvard University and graduated in three years, later becoming a U.S. Army cryptographer. That means he could decode message during World War II. After the war, he returned to Harvard for a law degree. Told you, you got to have a legal arm to everything that you do. He saw success as a lawyer, serving as a special assistant to the Attorney General Tom C. Clark and working as a partner at a law firm. In 1954, Redstone took over National Amusement, a private theater chain that was started by his father. Comes from a dynasty of media. He grew the business and by the 1980s, he was using it as collateral to bid for a cable broadcast and entertainment business that had been spun off by CBS in the late 70s. Viacom, home of brands including MTV, Showtime, and Nickelodeon. Isn't that a children's channel? Keep that in mind as we go on. A little over a decade later, in 1999, Redstone bought CBS itself in a $37.3 billion deal through National Amusements, now controls both Viacom and CBS. Both Viacom and CBS were plagued not too long ago, family, of sexual harassment suits. Keep that in mind. The business remained separate for decades afterwards. And in the 20, 2010s, the possibility of a merger became the subject of a high stakes legal battle with a non a a guarantee gen shoot why well, i can't say this word um meaning there was no stipulation that's what that word means redstone <laughs> is the center of it um in his late 80s and 90s redstone vowed to retain control of cbs and viacom at one point telling larry king on cbs i have no intentions of retiring or dying remember these blood sacrifices i think we talked about this a few months ago of how you have these um bars and clubs that have blood rituals where they either drink it like a vampire or inject it under their skin and so on and so forth and how this man was to, able to survive for that long keep that in mind he was the executive chairman of CBS and Viacom until 2016 and chairman of Emirates after that. He notably remained involved deeply, excuse me, he notably remained involved deeply, involved in the business in his old age. In 2018, he was said to have participated in business dealings primarily by communicating through an iPad equipped with audio clips of him saying yes, no, and F you, according to CNBC. He was something else. Um, this is Redstone at his peak. Um, the empire was worth $40 million today. It is worth $16 million now. Um, the company's holdings include, like I said, Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central. You wonder why Dave Chappelle had to walk away. We're going to get into all of that. Of course, he is deceased now. Viacom CBS will remain, will remember, excuse me, Sumner for his unparalleled passion to win, his endless intellectual curiosity, his complete dedication to the company. Viacom's president, Bob Backish, wrote in a statement on Wednesday. This was a year ago. Keep in mind, Bob Backish was accused of sexual harassment last year. Let's go on. Redstone is known as a ruthless litigator and negotiator. His new York Times obituary noted as much. I believe in taking every penny off the table, Redstone wrote in his 2001 autobiography. 
Wall Street Journal reporter Keech Haggy, 2018 book, The King of Content, Sumner Redstone's Battle for Viacom, CBS, and Everlasting Control of His Media Empire. Um, I got to get that book. I'm definitely going to do that probably tomorrow. Chronicled Redstone's rise and apparent obsession with immortality and continued control of his empire. His latest year were plagued by questions about his health and faculties. Redstone, Redstone was survived by his son, Brent um, Redstone, and daughter, Sherry Redstone, who now in control of the family dynasty. I believe the son is also a rabbi now. Um, he is a lawyer and a rabbi. They are to children from his first marriage to Phyllis Raphael. Here's a breakdown of who's who in the Redstone family. This was his last wife prior to his death. But he has some freakish ways, and we're going to get into all of that. Variety reported that all of Redstone stock would be left to his grandchildren, which was dis disclosed during the divorce settlement. Now, I'm going to skip past this real quick because I want you to see the family breakdown and what's been happening. Um, the family have been trying, uh, brothers and sisters, to get him to step back prior to his death because they pretty much thought that he was losing it. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Sherry Redstone also owns, like I said, 20% of national amusements and is one of seven trustees to the voting stake. Um, she has three children. Now, this is his daughter, her ex-husband, Ira Croft, a rabbi. Look him up. Their children are all involved in the family business. My father led an extraordinary life that was not only shaped by entertainment as we know it today, but created an incredible family legacy. Sherry Redstone told Variety in a Wednesday statement, through it all, we shared a great love for one another and he was a wonderful father, grandfather, great grandfather, blase blah. Let's get down to what this fool was into and his children. Uh, let me push down here. Give me a second family because this is a very lengthy article and I'll definitely post it on the Thorough Black Talk Facebook page so you guys can get it and read it for yourselves in your own time. Now, at the time of um, before his death, this man had a wife, two living lovers, um, also fighting for uh, stakes in the trust after that. You also had fighting amongst the children um, because he pitted them once, one against the other. Um, and his daughter, Sherry, right here says she has three children. Please research who her ex-husband was, the rabbi. Kimberly, Brandon, and Tyler, all three children are involved with national amusement. Kimberly, 38, is a lawyer. Brandon, 36, is a real estate developer. And Tyler is a lawyer and rabbi. So when we say the hats is at the helm, there is no lie here. There is no lie here. And um, this just confirmed what we were saying. But this man would have multiple sex tricks. Um, with these um, living lovers that he had while having a wife who was, I think, 40 years his junior. Um, and I said the, 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 um, the CEO, uh, Bob Backish, um, was also uh, accused of sexual harassment. Remember CBS, the head of CBS, Le uh, Les Moonves, accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault, Les Moonves being the husband of Julie Chen. Um, and you wonder why we are compromised. You wonder why you saw the disrespectful um, presentation of black culture during the BET Awards. This is why. Fish thinks at the head. The entire 
family dynasty is screwed up. He would um, further in the article, like I said, I'm going to post this so you guys can read it for yourself. But they talk about how he had an undying lust, you know, and couldn't control himself. It, it, it just, it's just crazy. But nobody, nobody um, in the F, uh, A, a C, FCC uh, pulled the reins on this family media dynasty. Nobody pulled the reins on them. But if we say something out of tune here, YouTube will pull our broadcast. They will shadow ban our channel. They will pull broadcasts that we have already posted if we have a dissenting comment. But nobody is stopping this media family that puts out this disgusting nature before black people want to have the audacity to say it's the year of the black woman. How can you have people who accused of sexual harassment, assault, and the things of that nature be at the helm of some of the most, most watched media platforms today? And you wonder why you see what you see watching shows like The Shy and all of that, all the homosexuality that is going on there. Um, I don't know that many homosexuals. I don't. And it seems now with media that they are now um, leading the culture, leading the voice of black entertainment. And we can't have a dissenting opinion, voice, education and know-how something is wrong in all that i see my brother ashe as jay is in the building how you feel He's ashe. yeah 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 i'm feeling great yo part of my talkiness man devon time and as usual though but i had to go out i had to support you know shout out to my friend rachel she doing huge things man she got it she just opened up her first brick and mortar her first location um, she has a full store um, downtown Brooklyn. Y'all remember, we old school Brooklyn, so we call it Alby Square Mall. Yeah. But they converted it now. They renovated it. It's beautiful now. It's Now they call it City Point. But, you know, it's the same mall of us, but, you know, they got some new stores and things of that nature. And they got an amazing lower level with a whole bunch of food vendors. So her business is called Killer Willy. Ghanaian food from Africa with a, with a twist for diaspora, everything, plantains. So today was the grand opening, so I had to pull up. It was amazing. The boy is super full right now. Plantain, I had a plantain burger. I had plantain ice cream, and I had plantain brownie. And then I also had the Killy Willy, which is another plantain dish from Ghana. And uh, I'm crazy full right now. So if y'all see me dozing off with the itis, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know what it is. But listen, the food was amazing. Do yourself a favor. She actually ships work um into um well at least national now she ships certain things nationally, so y'all could go check her out. She got a website, Killer Willie. It's K E L E W E L E, Killer Willie, African street dish from Ghana, and the food was amazing, man. So shout out to her. It's always good to see young people engaging in business of their own. You know what I'm saying? And you know I say S J solid African. Everything I do, I always try to even throw a black talk. We always highlight. Black owned businesses. So I had to pull up for the for the grand opening. It was beautiful, man. Just to see like so many black people, you know, like everybody's just around, gathered around the store. Everybody's excited to try the food and it's making other people watch and look and like now we got the Asians coming. Now we got, you know, the Latin brothers and sisters. And now we got, you know, so many people, white people, they coming and looking like what's going on. You know, when they see black people, they already know the culture is there. They already know. Something big is going down. When they see a group of black people, they, they automatically going to pay attention. You know what I'm saying? They know something good is being cooked up. So, you know, um, a lot of people was coming over and trying the food. And it was really good. It was amazing. So I, I got to make it out, make an appearance. You know what I'm saying? And we always support black-owned businesses up here. But, you know, I know y'all going in on the entertainment. You know, um, did you see the BET Awards, uh, Ashe? And shout out to that restaurant. Uh, before you go in, because it just so happens that my cousin Tashima sent that to us early this morning to check that restaurant out. Look at that. So, um, 
Yeah, shout out to Tashima. But um, before I go further too, I want to say happy uh, Independence Day. Today is Independence Day for three African nations. It's Rwanda, Somalia, and Burundi. Three countries in Africa celebrating their Independence Day today. So big shout out to them. You know, we always keep a, a, a African family, especially we got people that tune into us across the continent, you know, across the globe. So shout out to everybody that supports us. But, um, you know, definitely Rwanda, Burundi, and Somalia, Burundi and Somalia, um, you know, hail up to y'all, man. Independence is a, is, a, is a true thing. We still fight for our black African-American independence here. You know what I'm saying? We still fight for that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, yeah, shout out to them. And then on the entertainment line, you know, it's ill that we're talking about this because um, right now I was actually tempted to not come on the show. I'm not going to lie. I was super tempted not to come on the show because they got the verses going now right now. Keith Sweat and, 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 and Bobby <laughs> Brown. got to get that replay for real. I'm Damn. No real black talk. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a little, I don't know. That keeps wet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bobby. And I'm telling you, they the day got the DJ Rock and he playing the um all of the um the 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 um damn, what's the movie? Uh New Jack City. He playing all of them. So what you call that? New Jack Swing? They yeah. play all the New Jack Swing songs, right? I'm like, oh, he played the Aaron Hall. I'm like, damn, they going in right now. So shout out to them. But, you know, it's interesting that we're having this conversation about entertainment, too, because I didn't watch the BET Awards. I stopped watching that stuff. You know, even though I listen to some of the music, you know, we know BET is not operated for black people. That's not black entertainment television anymore. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe you could you could call it entertainment television, because when you break down the word entertainment, that's exactly what it's doing. It's containing us. It's, it's, a, it's a compound word. We forget about uh entertainment being a compound word enter and the suffix of tainment which is like containment you know what i'm saying so when you get entertained they capture in you that's what they say right they want to capture your atten att attention capture the audience that's what they say so entertainment is something that is also capturing you so that's why we like to say edutainment or educate whatever you want to say so if you're going to get entertained at least let it be something that's going to put you in the right direction as well but well, most of the entertainment now is just capturing us and it's keeping us on this low energy, this low frequency. And that's not where we need to be, at least not 24 seven. But right now with the verses, it's interesting because I was catching a little bit of it on my commute here. And I noticed that because, you know, um, Swiss Beats and Timberland who started Versus, the two produced, music producers that started Versus, they sold the platform to Triller, which is of course a white owned company. So Trilla is now, I think it's like a, they trying to be like a Netflix or something like that, Trilla, and they have like a lot of like, they doing own events and shows. They had a boxing match and that's big right now. And now they own Versus. Um, Floyd Mayweather recently fought the white, some white boy on the Trilla app as well. Paul Logan. But that's a white owned company. You know, so Trilla has now purchased Versus. They own Versus now. And I noticed that they starting to play commercials. Now, anybody that watches Versus, no, ain't no damn commercials. If the artists take a break, that's a DJ set. You go ahead and DJ right. spin all the good tunes and all of that. But now, today, I noticed that they play some commercials. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's interesting, man. And it's it's it's, it's like they water things down. They, wet, they, they make things whack and cornier than it used to be. And it waters down the culture. But at the same time, it's like, all right, so you got a commercial. So this is the first commercial. They watered it in with some little, I think it was like an Essence commercial from, for Essence Magazine, right? But we all know that Essence Magazine ain't nothing positive for black people. We already know the agenda that they push in Essence Magazine. So after that commercial, what's the next commercial? What's the, you just watering us down so you can start feeding us commercials after commercials, every versus, so now we get used to seeing commercials. I'm not going to be surprised when they start playing these commercials about LGBT or about they already had um Kamala Harris on the verse. She was on what was that? The Brandy verse, Monica versus Kamala Harris had her own segment in the front. Matter of fact, what's the other one? Stacey Abrams, right? She was on the verses too. She went on the Gucci main verse, Jeezy versus. I'm like, first of all, this don't even make no goddamn sense. You got two of the most hood ghetto rappers. All they do is talk about 
selling drugs. That's what both of them talk about. Young Jeezy and Gucci Mane, they talk about selling drugs. That's what they claim the fame is. And then you got Stacey Abrams at the beginning of that. She's trying to get people to, she specifically went up there to talk about getting people to vote for Biden. This was before Biden uh, won the presidency. She went up there talking about getting people to vote Democrat and all of this. Because you know they're going to put somebody that look black or that's black and they don't have our agenda. Or they put Kamala that look black, she half black with all kind of other agendas. But now they're making this a political thing. So now they're trying to feed, and they've been doing it. I mean, even Jay-Z, Beyonce, so many celebrities been trying to use their platform and their power to make people, uh, guide our people into the direction of voting Democrat or voting for this person and things. Like that. They've been doing that. But now it's becoming more prevalent and more prevalent. So in the ed- entertainment, the containment <laughs> of what they're doing by dancing and shucking and jobbing and grabbing your attention. I like to say the um, stick and carrot. Everybody know what the, the stick and carrot is, the horse and carrot. Back in the days, if you wanted to have a horse and you wanted it to move, instead of whipping it, they would have a stick with a carrot on the end of it. And they will put the stick in front of the horse and the horse would see the carrot and the horse would want the carrot. So the horse would run and try to get the carrot, but it would never catch it because the damn slave master is holding the stick. So he never letting that horse get that carrot. That's exactly what they doing with us. They try to entertain us and, and put some little rap up here and all of that. And you know what I'm saying? And then they put a little water down with some Stacey Abrams, some Kamala Harris, you know? And that's how they get you. So now next thing you think, oh, Kamala Harris is down. Stacey Abrams is on the G- Young Jeezy and Gucci Mane. She listen to them? Hell no, she don't listen to them. Ask a damn single word. Matter of fact, they had that Asian dude. Remember the Asian dude recently that was running for New York City mayor? I think he's still running. They asked Andrew him, Yang. No, it's over. He conceded. Yo, he made a fool of his goddamn self. I don't know if y'all saw the article. It was like a couple weeks ago. He was talking about um, he's a true New Yorker and he, he loves Jay-Z so much. That's what he's a real New Yorker. So his favorite rap artist is Jay-Z. So the person that interviewed him said, oh, yeah, Jay-Z is your favorite artist? Name your favorite Jay-Z song. He didn't know a damn Jay-Z song. Then they asked him, he said, oh, I'm a, um, I'm a real New Yorker. He said, I love New York. Like, uh, I, there's so many places in New York City, like the towns in New York that I love. And they said, okay, so name your favorite town in New York City. What's your favorite place in New York City? He said, Times Square. <laughs> First of all, Times Square don't have nothing but tourists. So how the hell is New York in, t- in New- the whole New York City, five boroughs, you talking about you a real New Yorker, and Times Square is your favorite New York neighborhood? You know, but this is what happens with these politicians. Like they come in, they try to make it, do things and make it sound good. They latch on to our culture specifically, and then they try to take their agenda somewhere else. And we see it time and time again, but unfortunately, a lot of our people fall for it because we start to think, oh, they down. They with us and they not family. So, you know, this whole entertainment thing with Keisha, you breaking it down about Viacom and all of that. Like, man, this has been going on for, for, for so long, yo. You know, like the, the very beginning of the music as an industry, not as music musicians and artists. You know what I'm saying? Because we've been doing that since the beginning of time. You know, we had music from the very beginning of time. We had entertainment for ourselves from the very beginning of time. You know what I'm saying? We always been talented, but when it became a, a, a industry, when it be, when music became a business, that's where everything shifted. You know what I'm saying? Whether you want to call it Illuminati or whatever the case is, there's some people behind the scenes. So it might not be no crazy spiritual Illuminati thing, but there definitely is a secret group of people that pull strings like puppeteers and manipulate certain things, especially people and these young artists that come into the industry because they sign their life away. You know what's interesting too? And I'm gonna pass the mic. Right now, even with their own people, family, they do the same goddamn thing. This is how ruthless these people are. Cause right now, who's one of the most prevalent artists ever in history that's going through it right now? I ain't talking about Bill Cosby. I talk about their own people, Britney Spears. Britney Spears, right now, their own people is going through it. They got her on, what you call a conservatory or something like that? They got her on, they got Britney Spears on some program where she's not allowed to get her own money. Her father 
owns her, the whole Britney Spears catalog. Every time she gets paid royalties, it goes directly to her father. And then he has to divide and say, how much am I going to allow Britney Spears to have? You know what I'm saying? So they control her, you know, they, they control her. I and mean, she's trying to fight for her estate or for her freedom right now. You know, so once they get you in a position, you sign these contracts, you sell your soul, you making money. And you know what that is to them? You know what these new artists, especially these black artists in the entertainment industry is to them? Passive income. That's all they are. Passive goddamn income. They looking at artists like goddamn investments. That's all they looking at. Why do you think they don't care about the music? That's what they are, an investment. That's exactly what they are. Why do you think they don't care about the, the message in the music? Why do you think they'll let them, uh, even a 14-year-old artist, get a record deal, talk about shooting up kids and, and, and using, taking Percocet, all these kind of new drugs I don't even know about, you know what I'm saying? And these damn adult uh, um, record industry owners and things of that nature that own the record companies, executives, they don't give a damn. Ain't nobody stepping in and saying, yo, you should say that, you 14 years old, you know what I'm saying? They don't care because it's investment. They know that the things that you say, no matter what it is, it's going to make money, even though it's damaging our people, it's going to make them passive income. And if you die, if you get murdered on behalf of the things that you say in the song, that's actually better for them. So they want you to say that you're going to kill and shoot your brother and sister and you're going to use all these drugs. Either you're going to get murdered and shot or you're going to die, overdose off drugs. And what's going to happen? You still making royalties when you're dead. So all of that money they get, and that's passive income for them. Every time you get a royalty check, no matter if you dead or not, matter of fact, if you die, you make more money. Why do you think all these people say these conspiracy theories about Michael Jackson, Prince, all of these artists that pass on? And they say right at the time when Michael Jackson was about, he bought Sony and all of that, he was buying all these things. People say it's conspiracy, right? But I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing the same thing to Britney Spears right now. I'm not saying that I like Britney Spears or listen to her at all. But if you can't even get money to, you got to go to your father <laughs> as a grown person with children, you got to go to your father to get money. And you still, they got a documentary on it. It's on Netflix where Britney Spears, she's on house arrest and they, her father has to know everywhere she goes, she got to call and get permission to get certain kind of money and all that. Like, it's crazy what they do, family. So they really, once you sign your life away, they really have you as a, a literal slave. You know what I'm saying? And if you die, that's what they want. They're going to get more money off of your death, profit. They sell T-shirts. You know what I'm saying? After you actually, actually this is cases and studies that show that after the artist dies, they actually sell more records than when they was alive. You know what I'm saying? Then they could put together, oh, collaboration albums and what they call posthumous albums. That's after you die, posthumous. That's yeah. what they call it. Doing that right now with Pop Smoke. He had another album coming out. You know what I'm saying? The artists that make so much music before they die, they could keep putting more. I wouldn't be surprised if it's another goddamn Tupac or my, uh, 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 my, Michael Jackson album about to come out. You know what I'm saying? That's going to be the next verses. Watch. They got your whole catalog. You know what I'm saying? So this is the entertainment industry that we're dealing with. So we got to be very careful. And, you know, especially these youth. I know a lot of people are coming, coming up and seeing this out of, I, as a as a as a way out of the hood and things of that nature, but at the same time, it's like even Kanye West said it himself. This Kanye West, he's a billionaire now, but right before they said he was a billionaire, wasn't he crying and complaining, talking about he was in debt and he was about to be a millionaire? But how you about to be a billionaire, but you still in debt because you owe so many people? So having money ain't all is cracked up to be family because you have money, but you can still owe people. You know what I'm saying? You can still, Kanye West is still fighting for his masters for his music. He don't even own his masters right now for his music. You know what I'm saying? But this is the entertainment industry. And that's, we're not even talking about, you know, the people that's trying to get into. We're talking about the people that's on already. So imagine what the people that's trying to get into the damn entertainment industry, what they got to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Imagine the, all the bending over and, you know, who's who knows what, sacrifices and all that. I ain't trying to sound too, too spooky. But it's a real thing out here, family. And a lot of our youngsters are, look at, look at how many young rappers have died. Look how many young rappers have died. In the drill scene, the new rap is the new rap right now. If y'all don't know about it, it's drill music. You know what I'm saying? 
all of those songs are talking about gang. It's gang related. Even from Brooklyn out here, it's gang related. So they, you got songs where people dissing each other and they in rival gangs. And then they, they might get signed. And then a year after they get signed, they get murdered. I'm talking about 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21 year olds getting murdered back to back to back. The, 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 uh, the, the rise in the killings that happened here in Brooklyn, that a lot of that was due to the music industry. A lot of that was due to the entertainment industry because you had two gangs, the Woos and the Choos, who uh, both of them had record deals. Both of these rappers, these, these groups, the Woos and the Choos, which are gang related, they both had record deals on each side. So they both trying to come up and be the king of New York and be the, the next up and coming rappers. And then they making songs dissing each other. And then they, they going after each other and shooting each other. So now we, Brooklyn and New York City has had one of the most deadliest years when it comes to deaths in a long ass time. The music industry plays a part in that. Do, I, do we see on the news when they talk about all these deaths? Do you see the, the record executives talking about that? No. Do you see them going to the funerals? Any of these A&Rs or these record executives that think it's okay for these rival gangs to go on record and disrespect each other? Because they played a part in it. If you ask me, they damn accessories to the murder. But this is the entertainment industry we're dealing with, family. So, you know, not to be a long-winded fan, but, yo, it's it's interesting. So, you know, I'm glad you brought up that information in the videos that you share, sharing, Keisha, because we got to show exactly who these people are that own these companies because they literally make it passive income. And I ain't saying don't get into the music industry, family. If you are artist and you are becoming and that's your lifelong dream and you want to do that, you got the right. You should live up your dream. But well, all I'm saying is we got to have some kind of system where it's educating our young people on how to even read a contract. You know what I'm saying? Most of them don't even read it. You're so excited. you just going to sign away. You don't even know what you're signing on. And then on top of that, some of the goddamn contracts is faulty. They reword certain things here and there and all of that. And you don't even know. You can't even understand the goddamn contract. You need a lawyer with you just when you sign in a contract. You know, a couple of them. So, you know, they, they got a lot of loopholes to get up all people in and out. And even like I said, the people that look like they got money and millionaires and stuff, all of these these artists with diamond chains on, just because they got diamond chains and cars don't mean they got money. It don't mean they got money, family. Because you could get a car and you could get a diamond chain, but that don't mean you wealthy. You know what I'm saying? You could get gifts. You know what I'm saying? And, and most of the goddamn cars and the diamond chains, when you look at the jewelers that all of these rappers got their jewelry from, are they black? Nope. If, go on Instagram. Go on YouTube. Look up the jewelers. The jewelers that sell these ice style Jesus chains and all the chains, they the choker chains that these rappers is wearing. All of them are Arabs. All of them are Middle Eastern Arabs or uh, Acidic Jews. That's the ones that run the market. What's that movie with Adam Sandler? I didn't even watch it. I heard it was a good movie, though. Where Adam Sandler, he played the jeweler. I don't remember the name of the movie. I think it was called, I can't remember. But it was a movie. It came out like a year ago where Adam Sandler, he was a jeweler. You know, he's a huge ass Jew. You know what I'm saying? But ain't no difference. That's right there. That's reality. They are imitating life. You know what I'm saying? Because the Jews and the Arabs are the ones that have these, these companies. So they happy. Once you, Bobby Spurda got out of jail, <laughs> first thing he did, he went to the jeweler, got iced out. I want to be fresh. But where's his money going? Right to the Arab community. And black people, meanwhile, we the ones that got the diamond mine. So these Arabs, these Russians, these Chinese, it's in Ghana and all over Africa, mining our minerals to take it here, make some jewelry, and sell it back to our people here. And take money. You know what I'm saying, family? So this is it's madness, man. So when we talk about the entertainment industry, listen, family, just if you're getting into it, know what you're doing. Try to get with somebody that knows something and like learn from it because we got to own everything. We got to own our own masters as artists. You know what I'm saying? We got to look at this as a business, you know, and a lot of the artists come in. They don't understand that it is the business. Bit. It's the music industry. They just think they're going to come in and be a talented person and everybody's going to have their back because they like your songs. Nah, they ain't going to have your back because they like your songs. They trying to profit over you. That's why when they book you for a show, 
you got to show up. <laughs> if you don't show up for that show they book you for, you're going to have to deal with them people and they're going to sue you because it's a business. They ain't booking you because they want to hear you, see you perform. They booking you for the show because of the return on their investment they're going to get. Because they know when you come to the show, you're going to bring a lot of people and all those people are going to buy tickets. They're going to buy merch and they're going to buy the bar, buy alcoholic drinks and all of that. And that's how they make their money. But we still don't think of this as a business. We still we think of it as oh, we still gonna go perform and tear the show up, and we dope ass artists, and that's it. You know what I'm saying? So we gotta stop, you know, letting them take advantage of us. Because as long as we let them, they're gonna continue. They're not gonna out of the kindness of their heart <laughs> wake up in the morning one day and say, you know what? It's a good day to be nice to black people. Mm-hmm. You know the sun the sun them came outside today. You know what? Ain't no clouds in the sky. Let's 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 be nice. Let's be a black person's friend. That ain't happening. We've been waiting for how long? Over decades, hundreds of years for that to happen. So we're gonna be waiting forever for that. So. But go ahead, family. But um, brother Edie, I mean, yes, I definitely saw uncut gems. Um, actually, my brother, my barber, hit me to that a couple of years ago. Shout out to Fat Mike. But he hit me up to that. Um, brother, um, Ted, any comments before I move to this next clip? Nah. Brother, I should laid it out. There you go. The young lion came in and slayed it. <laughs> As he always does. Uh, hold on, family. Check out this clip. Um, and we're going to show you in this clip. Um, I think Brother Ted sent me this as well. But here... You have an explanation. Shout out to Black um, for posting this on Instagram. And you can follow them on Instagram as well. But here is a breakdown of how they use benign neglect um, to divert from passing legislation or dealing with any issues specifically for Black people, even though you carry the vote. Hold on one second. Benign neglect. Benign neglect is the official unofficial policy of ignoring black issues and never committing to putting forth policy and or legislation that will exclusively benefit black Americans. All conversations surrounding black issues, let alone policy and legislation, must always incorporate the terms people of color, minority, marginalized groups, and at the bare minimum, black and brown. Doing this effectively dilutes black issues, which then by default dilutes the solutions needed to correct them. Though benign neglect is practiced by both the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democratic Party has mastered the art of benign neglect due to the fact that black Americans are their political base. Now, what I'd like to do is show you a few examples of Democrats going out of their way to ignore and talk around black issues. These are the real life examples of benign neglect. Why not target? The African American community. Why not say then, this is for you? This is for African Americans. If if there was a banking crisis, then you target money for the banks. If yeah. there was a national disaster, you target uh, you target your money for the national for no, 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 uh, no, no, for no, disaster that, relief. That, 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 that's not how uh, that's not how America works. America works when all of us are pulling together, and everybody is focused on making sure that every single person has opportunity. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole in the country. Right. Vice President Biden, do you support reparations? Well, I mean, since I haven't spoken on this, got a chance. Um, number one, the reason we're the country we are is because of immigration. We've been able to cherry pick the best from every single continent. The people who come here have determination, resilience. They are ready to stand up and work like the devil. We have 24 out of our 100 children in our school today is Hispanic. The idea that we are gonna walk away and not provide every opportunity for them is not only stupid and immoral, but it's bad for America. They are the future of America and we should invest in them. Everybody will benefit from it, every single American. And you should get used to it. This is a nation of immigrants. That's who we are. 
That's why we're who we are. That's what makes us different. And we should invest in it. Thank you, Mr. Biden. Senator Klobuchar, you had your hand up. When Barack Hussein Obama, America's first biracial president, was asked the question, why not target the black community directly? And he replied, no, 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 that, that's, relief. That, 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 that's not how uh, that's not how America works. Obama was 100 percent correct when he stated that's not how America works. In fact, it hasn't worked that way since 1970, because this was the year that Daniel Patrick Moynihan, advisor to President Richard Nixon, submitted his 10 page memorandum to the president. And the opening paragraph reads, as the new year begins, it occurs to me that you might find useful a general assessment of the position of Negroes at the end of the first year of your administration and of the decade in which their position has been the central domestic political issue. Now, the memorandum would go on to chronicle the decade of the 60s, discussing the progress made by black Americans, as well as their shortcomings that still needed improvement. But it's not until page seven that the two words that would annihilate black American politics for the next 50 years would appear. The time may have come when the issue of race could benefit from a period of benign neglect. The subject has been too much talked about. The form has been too much taken over by hysterics, paranoids, and boodlers on all sides. We may need a period in which Negro progress continues and racial rhetoric fades. The administration can help bring this about by paying close attention to such progress as we are doing while seeking to avoid situations in which extremists on either race are given opportunities for martyrdom, heroics, histrionics, or whatever. Greater attention to Indians, Mexican-Americans, and Puerto Ricans would be useful. I'm going to repeat that last sentence again. Greater attention to Indians, Mexican-Americans, and Puerto Ricans would be useful. Now, you see, it's at this moment that the American government made its decision to ignore black politics and shift the conversation to Native Americans and immigrants. Now, fast forward to 2020, and that list now also includes not only Native Americans and immigrants, but the LGBTQ, as well as women's issues by way of feminism all the while ignoring Black American politics. Now, one of the newest ways that we watched women's and LGBTQ rights issues used to neutralize Black issues have been in the Black Lives Matter movement. You see, when you say Black Lives Matter, you've said all that needs to be said because the problem at hand is police brutality against Black Americans. But once you start interjecting hashtags into it, like Say Her Name or Black Trans Lives Matter, you've effectively turned it from an issue about police brutality against Black people to an issue of feminism and to an issue of LGBTQ struggles. The Black Lives Matter movement has been so strategically fragmented that we've come to the point to where now people say, all black lives matter. That's how fragmented it is. When speaking on matters of immigration, you never hear anybody say, well, what about all immigrants? What about LGBTQ immigrants? What about female immigrants? What about the LGBTQ Jews? What about female Jews? What about all Jews? It's only black issues that get fragmented in this way. Now, over the course of the past 12 years, the Democratic Party has truly mastered the art of benign neglect by coming to the understanding that the best way to ignore black politics is to do it in blackface. Now, for starters, don't let it go over your head that the family lineage of the first so-called black president and possible vice president don't actually come out of the slave plantations of America. They have no ties to the legacy of slavery and the hardships of Jim Crow. Barack Hussein Obama, whose mother was white and his father was Kenyan, moved to Indonesia when he was six years old. He moved back to Hawaii when he was 10, where he was raised by his white grandparents. Kamala Devi Harris, whose mother is Indian and her father is Jamaican, was born in Oakland and moved to Montreal, Quebec, Canada when she was 12 years old. Now, why does that matter? Well, that matters because you don't even begin to form a general understanding of who you are and how the world works and what's your place in it until your teenage years. From one to five years old, you don't even know that you're alive. And from five to 12 years old, life is simply about how many days it is until my birthday. Is it Christmas yet? When is Halloween? And can we go to Chuck E. Cheese? Your teenage years are your most critical years as it pertains to the development and understanding of the world around you, as well as who you actually are as you head into adulthood. And this time period for her was spent in a completely different country, attending a French-speaking primary school and high school. Upon graduating high school was when she moved back to the States to attend college. You see, these type of folks are passing for Black 
because they grow up having no real connection to black Americans. But once they enter politics, they then ride the wave of slavery and Jim Crow to legitimize a blackness within them that doesn't exist. And this is the brilliance behind the Democrats' mastery of benign neglect. You see, because if I can get a so-called black president or possible vice president to say, I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. Well, then that justifies politicians ignoring black issues on all levels of politics. Because how are you going to call a non-black politician racist for ignoring you when so-called black presidents and vice presidents have already done the same? Were you aware that your great-great-grandfathers were slave owners in Alabama uh, before the Civil War? And has that revelation caused you to change your position on reparations? You know, I find myself once again in the same position as President Obama. We both oppose reparations and we both are the descendants of slaveholders. You see how that works? So now, because they have no policy for you, they have to sell you on their blackness. This is why Kamala Harris lied about smoking weed, listening to Tupac and Snoop Dogg in college, despite the fact that she graduated college in the 80s. This is why the Dems put out this awkward video of her dancing to Cardi B. This is why articles and videos of her keep coming out discussing her shoe game. I literally could keep going on and on, giving you example after example, but I'm going to end it here by showing you this last clip of an interviewer asking Kamala a very serious question about the contradiction and views between her and Joe Biden. And the response she gives is an extremely awkward, high pitched rant about being a black girl who likes hip hop. You supported the Green New Deal. You supported Medicare for all. You've supported legalizing marijuana. Joe Biden doesn't support those things. So are you going to bring the policies, those progressive policies that you supported as senator, into a Biden administration? What I will do, and I promise you this, and this is what Joe wants me to do, this was part of our deal. I will always share with him my lived experience as it relates to any issue that we confront. And I promised Joe that I will give him that perspective and always be honest with him. And is that a socialist or progressive perspective? No. <laughs> no, it is the perspective of, of a woman who grew up a, a, a black child in America, who was also a prosecutor, who also has a mother who arrived here at the age of 19 from India, who also, you know, likes hip hop. <laughs> What do you want to know? <laughs> well, I want to give you I want to give you the opportunity to address this. What is she talking about? This woman is so thoroughly conditioned to deflect and sell her blackness that she even does it when benign neglect isn't even warranted. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that me myself on Election Day, I will not be rewarding a party who constantly disrespects me to my face while pretending to be my friend. I'm not getting behind a party who my people have supported since 1964, giving them a super majority election after election, only to do nothing for them in return. Once again, I don't know what you're going to do, but for me, it's no tangibles, no vote, no black agenda, no vote, no reparations, no vote. Two words, benign neglect. Benign neglect is the official unofficial policy of ignoring black issues and never committing to putting forth policy and or legislation that will exclusively benefit black Americans. All conversations surrounding. And there it is. <laughs> That's it. Shout out to, I think it's TH Hip Hop um, posted by I Am Black. Thank you for that um beautifully put there's nothing else to say so i want you all as you vote or as you engage in um entertainment as my brother ashe said listen for these buzzwords look how they deflect and get you to go along with it using what did i say earlier rhetoric rhetoric you know, and shout out to Brother Second Ra. That that letter was sent to D 
then Democrat Senator Pat Moynihan to the Republican president at that time, Richard Nixon. So I don't care what side of the aisle you on. It's the same message. It's the same message. You know what's crazy is, is that the, the, the lady asked about the policies and she went into about being a little black girl. The lady looking confused like, what are you, nobody's been talking about race. But this is how they try to validate themselves and, and, and try to make everything about race. Though it is black first, she's not. <laughs> so here she just try to pull the card as if she's down for the people. And it's 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 just a circus to me. It's just it's just a big circus. And now all this information is finally coming out, but Again, hindsight is always 2020. We've been talking about this for years. We've been talking about this for years, but look at where we are now. We was talking about this before the pandemic, but the pandemic then got everybody all confused and disoriented. And when they were burning down precincts, I said, I hope they have the same energy when they start trying to force the vaccines on people. That energy was gone. It was all exerted through Antifa and their stage protests and rallies and bonfires and precinct burnings and yeah. Strange times we live in, but it's shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. Shenanigans. So please, family, as you go about your education and how this machine works, please take a moment, as my brother Taz says. Gather the information, come up with your own thoughts and your own conclusions, because if we keep following the status quo, we all going to leave here. Unless somebody got a magic pill, I can make us billions overnight. We all going to leave here. We cannot continue to leave generation after generation after generation in this condition. It's getting worse. Now you can't even call your son, your son, your daughter, your daughter. And they have the right as teenagers to change their gender, their identity on birth certificates, credit cards, debit cards. It's crazy. Like this is insane. The insane are running the asylum. And black votes, the black vote making this happen. Blindly, but making this happen. So from this day forward, become more educated in how this process works. We're going to post this information on our Thorough Black Talk Facebook page so you guys can have it and read it and watch it at your own leisure and do your own analysis. My brother, Ashe SJ. Yo, yeah, that video was off the chain. I ain't even going front. Like, I never heard of that term, but not neglect. But that is something that we need to pass around as a black community more often, especially when it comes to politics and things of that nature. Like we just said, they run in mayor for New York is running. And you know, it's it's crazy times, man. And that's that's exactly what they do. You know, it's like it's good to be able to put that into a term. And now we can try to utilize that term and, and that momentum to educate people. You know, at least people, you know, we have to have like go-tos, you know, for our people. Like we have to prepare in advance when you, especially when you are an educator, you have to have a method for teaching people. You know what I'm saying? So now that we have this term benign neglect, now maybe some of these people that are so blind, you know, when it comes to politics and they know, oh, they don't even know what to vote for. They just know what to vote against. That's how it is. It's like all people have just become, oh, we can't have this person in, so we're going to vote for this person. But you don't even know what you should be looking for in a goddamn candidate or what are the things to, to make you, when you think somebody is good and you hear something they say and they, you see their policy, what are the things that makes you change and be like, nah, this, this person is not really for us. You know what I'm saying? We don't know that. So we got to educate ourselves on these things. And I really like that term, you know, so we definitely got to share that video and get more people to know because they understand, like we always say on the show, I think I said it last week. They play with our emotions, especially when it comes to politics. They use the entertainment industry. You saw the video. That's why it all ties together. Kamala Harris dancing to Cardi B. 
and she looked stupid as hell. I don't know what the hell she was doing. But that's not how you dance to Cardi B. Ask Kamala Harris if she know how to twerk. I bet you she'll know how to twerk. Even the oh, most, <laughs> even the most conservative African queen, conscious woman out here know how to twerk, even if she's not doing it in public. You know why? Because twerking is an African thing. That came from the motherland. <laughs> I'm starting to sound like one of these conscious dudes that be out here preaching, right? But twerking really is African thing. <laughs> you can look up videos from tribes of women that used to, not they didn't call it twerking, but they did special dances, you know what I'm saying, for celebration, for all kind of different things. So that all that whining and all of that, that comes from African tradition. You know what I'm saying? It's just our sisters don't really know how to tie that in in a, in a way where it's respectable, where you're covering up your body, where you're not, you know, putting everything on front street for people to see. But let's ask Kamala Harris if she know how to twerk. She don't know how to do none of those moves. She danced like a what? She was dancing like like this how the white people at work dance. Oh, oh, that's how they dance at work. You know, you see them when you see them when you walking past in the city of Manhattan. Oh, and how you go to Times Square, you see them out there dancing. The black people dancing, playing music, and you watch the white people. They move the same move. Oh, that's what they do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's exactly what Kamala did. So but they know how to play off our emotions, family. They're going to call every celebrity they can. They're going to have every commercial. They're going to have all the politicians, you know, showing up to these events, doing the verses and all of that to play off of black people's heartstrings because they know that's all we need. We just want to feel better. We've been so used to feeling bad and feeling down and out and feeling like we don't have no hope. That's why Obama won. Remember, his whole campaign was hope. Remember? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Hope. That was Obama's whole campaign. And they know that. And the, the sad part is we still, as a mass of people, as a, as a majority, we still haven't come to terms with the fact that they are playing off our emotions. So we want to see us win so bad, we vote for people that look like us, even though they're not us. Even though the people... Even though the people that look like us or the people that are us that are in these positions ain't for us. So we still vote for their asses. You know what I'm saying? So we gotta just pick up and 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 you know it like Ty say, like I like to say a lot, that all goes back to starting with self. So before you even get into politics, you need to work on your self-improvement. You need to be certain of who you are on this earth. If you have your African mind or if you got a European mind, because if you don't know that, you're not certain of who, you're, who you are and who your family and your community is and your nation and your race, then you're going to go out blindly into something with all. Oh, you might have good intentions, but the system is rigged, set up. So people go in there with the best intentions and leave with the worst, leave with the worst agenda for all people. You know what I'm saying? So you got to, like Keisha say, stand on your square. Find your square, educate yourself before you entertain yourself. Educate yourself. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to the people in the entertainment industry that are trying to hold it down and, you know, spread, spread a conscious message. It's not many of them, but we do have a couple. You know, we definitely have to support. We got to share their information. We, unfortunately, we are in that. I guess you could say we entertainment. I mean, we do videos. We, you know, really we the media. But you know yeah, what I'm saying? We, we, have a we do information. We do information. So we're not really education, but we are an alum. We do have a, a, a platform and we take our responsibility. And a lot of people that are artists and have big platforms or entertainers, they try to like say they don't have a social responsibility, but they do. You have no choice but to have a responsibility. Now, if you let your responsibility go, and you don't want to use it, be, you don't want to be responsible, that's another thing. But you still on a platform where you are going to influence so many people just by blinking your eyes. You know what I'm saying? The little tiniest thing you do, you're going to influence everybody. You know? So it's what you do with that family. So, you know, I mean, we got, we winding down right now, but, you know, that was a great video. We definitely got to share that on a um, platform and everything. Share that on our YouTube. Please do us a favor. Share this video right now after we end. Share the video, DM it to some people. Let's grow this platform. Um, 
yeah, but anything else you want to say, Keisha, before I give my final and Ty give his final thoughts? Because I know we about to cut out. Nope. You guys give your closing commentary, and then we're going to close it out uh, with a, a clip from our brother Q Butter. Shout out to him in the Zyx Institute. They had graduations this week. Kudos to my little brother. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm proud of you. Thanks. Well, family, that's our time. Um, we want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight again. You know, the whole gist of it is get informed, you know, but implement critical thinking skills, you know, Whatever information I offer to you, take it with a grain of salt, whether it's mainstream media or whether it's what we tell you. You know, do your own research, draw your own conclusion, and make sure it line, it's in the line with your moral position. You know, um, because right now what politics is trying to do is create a moral barometer for each of its citizens. And you have to already come in the game with your own moral barometer in place, all right? So with that being said, I hope you were inspired since your turn to go out and inspire others. So y'all stay up, stay blessed, stay true. And remember, no matter how hard things may seem right now, it's always better days ahead. Brother Ashe. Yeah, family. Listen, like I said, shout out to three African countries, Burundi, Somalia, Rwanda. We love y'all family. Everybody on the continent that tunes in, Ghana, Nigeria, we appreciate y'all for y'all support. You know what I'm saying? And um, I just want to say, you know, make sure y'all follow my platform. I showed y'all Solid African. Follow the platform. Follow the YouTube page. I got a video up there. I got another one that I'm editing right now. Another powerful video. And um, shout out to everybody that's going to be at the International African Arts Festival this weekend. I'm telling y'all, I'm going to be there all three days, family. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we are at the International African Arts Festival right here in BK Commodore Barry Park. Man, I'm just excited. We back outside. We outside, fam. You know what I'm saying? We ain't been out in the whole year. You know, Dance Africa, they canceled that. So this is the only thing we got. But this is actually the, the huge, big thing. Three days. And um, I'm excited to see the family, all the African vendors that's going to be out there. Uh, I don't know who's, who's performing this year, but, you know, it's just a, always a good vibe when you get that kind of energy because it's like a, a conscious, you know, at least Afrocentric vibe. You know what I'm saying? So I'm excited to see the family out there. And I will be out there reporting live on the scene. Solid African will be out there at the International African Arts Festival this weekend. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube page and Facebook and Instagram and all of that at Solid African. But yeah, man, it's your brother Ashe SJ signing out. Do us a favor. Share this video. Yo, we see you on, you know what I'm saying, like in the streets. This is what we do. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Make Manifest. You know, we got another event that I'm building on right now. I'm working with a lot of artists. You know, we about to have some live painting. You know what I'm saying? People forget artists, painters, drawers. Those are businesses as well. You know what I'm saying? They artists, but they businesses as well. So I'm supporting all kind of black owned businesses. We got an event brewing, so I'm going to share that, that information with y'all coming up pretty soon. But you know, it's your brother, Ashe SJ. Always remember, family, true courage is knowing how to suffer, and the battlefield is where you stand. It's your brother, Ashe SJ, signing out. Sister Keisha. Again, family, as my brother said, we appreciate you guys coming in every week, sharing this platform. You can check us out. Again, Facebook, YouTube, now on Twitch. And now we on otwtube.com. You can catch the replay over there as well. Please follow K Fighter on these platforms. Follow K Fighter because I'm going to be doing some things that are separate and apart from Thorough Black Talk. And you definitely want to get in tune with that. You can follow my brother Tad on Instagram and Facebook, Better Days Ahead Fitness. That is Better Days Ahead fitness and of course brother Ashe SJ I will see you at the International Arts Festival we got some people coming in from out of town so we're going to definitely make that happen shout out to team swap downtown Brooklyn yep. every Tuesday double dutch it goes down live it goes down live and um sister Takia who often vends at City Point uh brother Ashe she will also be vending uh, fashions by TJ at the International 
Arts Festival. But we closing out with our little brother, Q Butter, in the Zyax Institute. He about to go in. We ain't got no, we ain't got no time for none of them. Cause we don't get no, we don't get no, we don't get no love from them. Cause most of them ain't from the side. Cause most of them just wanna watch. Cause most of them ain't gonna slide. Cause most of them just wanna talk. We ain't got no, we ain't got no, we ain't got no time for none of them. Cause we don't get no, we don't get no, we don't get no love from them. Cause most of them ain't from the side. Cause most of them just wanna watch. Cause most of them ain't gonna slide. Cause most of them just wanna talk. Please don't look to me for no type of sympathy. Cause the only thing I got for you is this fucking finger free. My ears are not close when you talk. I have no time for your speech. Your words do not match with your walk. You do not practice your preach. So now you are all about change. And now you are all about we. And now you won't unwrite the pains. And somehow I'm supposed to believe. I get too fucks about none of y'all. Look to me for no type of sympathy. Cause the only thing I got for you is this fucking finger free. My ears are not close when you talk. I have no time for your speech. Your words do not match with your walk. You do not practice your preach. So now you are all about change. And now you are all about we. And now you won't unwrite the pains. And somehow I'm supposed to believe. I get too fucks about none of y'all. Especially you poons and you rights. You gave us the pressure, then watch us fall. Now you won't speak but unite. If you're not speaking about reparations, how you gonna speak on our rights? But you want us to respect your nation. Put some respect on our lives. Eat a dick. Some Franks, nigga with Mac or the sauce. We talking slick. Fuck you think we not gonna fight for our cause? Listen.